Hello there, and welcome to this session on Azure SQL Containers. A little bit about myself first. My name is Andrew Prosky. I am a SQL Server DBA and Microsoft Data Platform MVP, originally from Swansea, Wales, but I've been living in Dublin, Ireland for about five years now. My Twitter handle, at DBA from the cold, is there on the screen, and DBA from the cold at gmail.com, my email address. So if you have any questions after this session, please feel free to get in contact. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. My blog's there as well, dbafromthecold.com, posted multiple articles about running SQL Server up in Azure in containers, some of which I'm using to base this session on, and some of which go into a little bit further information. So you're more than welcome to check those out as well. And finally, my GitHub account is there as well, github.com slash dbafromthecold. All the code from the demos that I'll be running today are up in my GitHub account, so you can absolutely grab those and run through everything that I'll be running as well. On to the session. SQL Server running in containers gives a brand new platform for us to run SQL Server in. We can run SQL Server in a Docker container locally, and we can spin up an instance of SQL Server in a very short period of time. And Microsoft have given us certain technologies up in Azure that we can use to spin SQL Server up in. And that is the aim of this session, to give you an overview of the different options available up in Azure to run SQL Server in containers. So here's what we'll cover. We will start off with the Azure Container Registry, a private managed registry up in the cloud that we can push our Docker container images to. Then we'll have a look at Azure Container Instances. Now this is Microsoft's serverless offering to allow us to run SQL Server in containers up in the cloud. And then finally, we'll have a look at Azure Container Services, Microsoft's offering to allow us to use an orchestrator to manage and deploy containerized applications up in the cloud. But first things first, the Azure Container Registry. Now this is a private managed registry up in the cloud that we can use to push our container images. Now I say private, only the people we have access to have access to it. And managed basically means we don't configure the storage for it. It's all handled by Microsoft up in the background. But first things first, let's have a quick refresh of some terminology because People, including myself, are very guilty of confusing these two terms. Now, we have a registry. Now, this is a service, usually remote, that stores container images. The Azure Container Registry is one. The Docker Hub is another. A repository is a group of container images, all got the same name, identified by tags. So if you went on the Docker Hub, which is a registry, you'd see Microsoft-Server-MSSQL, which is the 2016, 2017 images. And in there, you'd see the different tags. You see 2017, 2017 C1, C2, C3. So that is a Microsoft registry for SQL Server, repository, sorry, for SQL Server in a registry up in the Docker Hub. OK, let's talk about some features that Azure Container Registry has. The first one is encryption. All images are encrypted at rest. So when we push up and they're stored up in the cloud, they are encrypted. We have geo-redundant storage. Now this guards against a local regional storage failure. So if the storage goes down, Microsoft replicates our images to different locations so that we can still access our container images. The premium tier has geo-replication, which guards against a total regional failure. So if a whole region goes down, we can still access our images. And the final one there, ACR Tasks, this is a really cool container image build service. And we can use webhooks to hook into things like GitHub repositories. So if I push a commit to a GitHub repository and make a change to, say, a Docker file, it will automatically go off and build me a container image from that updated Docker file. Now, I mentioned the premium tier. There are three, well, there are four different tiers that we can pick when we building our Azure Container Registry. And as you'd expect, as you go up the tiers, you get more options. So you get storage, more IOPS, bandwidth, webhooks, and the premium tier there, it has the geo replication. Now there's three there, but I did say there's four. There is also a classic tier. This was the original tier when ACLs first came out, and it has since been deprecated, and it is advised not to use it. And you can switch between the tiers really, really easily. It's one line of code, but be warned if you create a classic ACR and you switch off it, you won't be able to go back. OK, so let's get into actually building an ACR, because I want this to be a really demo-based session. So what I'm going to use is I am going to use the Azure CLI. The Azure CLI is a cross-platform tool that we can use to manage our Azure resources. One thing I do want to mention is that each one of these commands has its PowerShell equivalent. And if you have a look up on my GitHub in the, uh, the code for this session, there is a Windows branch, and that has all the equivalent PowerShell commands in it. So you're more than welcome to use PowerShell, but I kind of like using the Azure CLI. So the first thing we need to do is log in 
to our Azure account. So we say Azure login, hit execute, that's going to spin us up a web browser. And that's the old version there where we type in a code. Now it'll do it automatically. It'll spin up a prompt, ask us to log into our account, and boom, we have logged into our Azure account in our command prompt there. So once we've logged in, we can then create a resource group to hold all the different bits and bobs that we are going to create in Azure. So we just say Azure group create, give it a name, containers one, and pick a location, East US, West Europe, things like that. The reason I usually pick East US is when I was building this session, a lot of these features were in preview and they weren't available in all the regions. And East US does seem to be the one that they open up preview features to first. So hit execute and that's going to go off and create our resource group. We have our resource group, we can deploy everything that we're going to build, so now we can create our Azure Container Registry. So we just say AZ, which is the keyword, ACR, Azure Container Registry, create. In our resource group of containers one, give it a name, test container registry or one, and pick in a tier. And this is my personal account, I'm cheap, so I'm going to go with the basic cheapest tier that I can go for. Hit execute, wait for that to complete, and that is it. We have created our ACR, literally two lines of code, one to create our resource group and one to create our registry. So we have our registry up in the cloud. Let's now build a container image that we can push up to it. So we first of all have to log into our registry just to say, hey, we're authenticated and we can push to it. So we say Azure ACR login and the name of our registry. And that will take the credentials that we've logged in with our Azure account push them through and say, yes, you are logged in to that registry and you can now push container images to it. Okay, so in order to push our images to our registry, we need to grab some details. What we're looking for is a login server name. It's this test container registry onezureecrio So to pull out all the details of our registry, we say Azure ACR list in the resource group containers one. And that's going to list all registries that we have in that resource group. Whereas we've just got the one, we just get the one pulled back here. And we need to make a note of that login server name. And that login server is what we're going to tag our custom Docker image so that when we push, it knows where it's going up in the cloud. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's build a custom Docker image from a Docker file. And all a Docker file is, is a file on my host that when I hit a Docker command, it steps through each one of the lines in this Docker file and builds me my custom image. So the first thing there, I'm going to build from my new image from the existing Microsoft SQL Server 2019 CTP 2.2 Linux image running on Ubuntu. So I'm basing it off that image. I'm then going to make a directory within my container called var opt SQL Server. And I'm going to copy a couple of database files into that location. Now note, there's no file path to those database files, so they have to live in the same location as the Docker file. You can specify file paths, but I keep it nice and simple. I like to keep everything together, and it looks nicer on the slide this way. I'm then going to copy a script in called attach-db. Now, all this script is doing is running a create database statement when executed against the two files that I've copied into my container. I won't go into too much details about it now because there's a little trick to it, and I'm going to go through it a little bit more in the demos. So I'll actually delve into what that script is doing when we hit the demos in a few minutes. The next stage is I am setting some environment variables in my container, and all these environment variables are doing is specifying the default backup data and log directories of my SQL Server instance. Now you can sort of see where we're going with this. Not only, when we spin a container up from this image, not only are we going to have a database called database A ready to go, we're going to have a configured SQL instance with the backup data and log default directory set to that directory that we created here. Second to last point is we are making the script that we attached into the container executable. And then finally, we are running a final entry point just to run our script and then execute a SQL Server binary, which gets SQL Server running. An entry point, all this is saying is when the container runs up, this is the first thing that's going to run. And the trick here is the fact the attach database script is running before the SQL Server binary spins up. And there's this little trick to it, which I'll go through in the demos. But that's our Docker file. When we execute that, it's going to build us our custom image. 
That's really nice and simple to build a custom image. We're just going to say docker build dash T, tag our new image with a name, test image, and then specify a location to where our Docker file lives. Hit execute, and we can see Docker stepping through each one of the commands in our Docker file and building us our custom image. So once we have that image, we can then tag it, and we need to tag it with that login server name that we pulled out of our Azure container registry. So say Docker tag, our test image that we just built, test container registry 01.azurecr.com io dev sql image colon latest now what this is going to do when pushed to our azure container registry is going to build us a repository called dev sql image and identify the image that we've just pushed with a tag of latest so test container registry one is our registry dev sql image is our repository and that image is identified by the tag of latest so once we've tagged it we can then push it up to the cloud and it's nice and simple we've already logged into the registry we've tagged our image so we just say docker push test container registry 01 dot azure cr dot io dev sql image code on latest hit execute and depending on the size of the image or your internet connection this can take some time but hopefully it'll go up no issues and then we can verify that is up in the cloud and so we do that just by saying azure acr repository list name test container registry and give us specify an output TSV table. And that is going to show us the one repository that we have up in our Azure Container Registry, the Dev SQL Image Repository. If you want to dive into that repository and show the tags that are in there, we can just say Azure ACR repository show tags in our registry, test container registry 01, and then specify in the repository of Dev SQL Image. We've only pushed the one image up there with the one tag of latest, so that is what is returned. Okay, let's just dive straight into a demo and let's push an image up to the cloud. So I have uh, Visual Studio Code here. If anyone hasn't used Visual Studio Code, it is a really excellent scripting environment. I use it all the time and it's got a really nice plugin for the Azure CLI and it's got a nice Kubernetes plugin as well, which I'll show you later. So here it is. Got my script here. The first thing to do is log in to Azure. And this should bring up a nice prompt. I'm already signed in, but let's do it anyway. And I can close that down, and I'm now logged in here. I've already created the registry, so I'm just going to log straight into it. There we go. And I need to pull out that login server name of my registry. Little query there, just to strip out all the unnecessary details that I don't need. I just need that one login server name. Okay, so locally on my host, I have the Microsoft SQL Server image there, and I'm going to build from that image. So before I go ahead and build this, let's go and have a look at that Docker file. Here is exactly the same as in the slides. So we're building from the Microsoft image, making a directory, copying our database files in, copying our attached db.sh script, setting our environment variables, changing the ex making it executable. And then there's this entry point here where we're executing the attached DB script before we're spinning up SQL Server. Now, if we go and have a look at that attached DB script, it has a sleep command before it goes and creates the database here from the two files that we've copied in to our container. Now, the reason for this is Docker containers need a process to be running in order for them to stay up. So if we switch that round and run the SQL binary, and then the attached database script. SQL would spin up, we'd attach the database, and because the attached database was the last process, the container then would shut down. And I actually struggled with this quite a bit. I couldn't work out what was going on until I read uh, Bob Ward's book, uh, SQL Server on Linux. Uh, if you have a chance to get a copy of it, I highly recommend it. And it was in there where they showed this little trick of putting the sleep command in before the attached database script so that the script executes, waits 10 seconds, by then SQL has come up and the database is then attached. But because the SQL command there is the last one in our Docker file, SQL keeps running, our container stays running. Okay, we can now build our image. So I'm just saying docker build dash t, tag my image name test image, and this is the location to my Docker file. So we hit execute and Docker will start stepping through each one 
of the commands within that Docker file and building us our custom image. There we go. Creating a directory, copying the database files in, setting the environment variables, and then finally, we've got the entry point. And I'm getting a security warning there because I'm running on Windows against a non-Windows Docker host. So maybe some file permissions within my containers might be a little bit more open that I'd like and I might want to go in and fix them. But as I'm just doing this as a demo, I'm going to leave them as they are. Move on, and we're going to have a look at the image. So there we are, we have the test image there, the tag of latest. And I need to tag that new image that we've built with my login server name, apregistry.azurecr.io. It's going to go into the repository of dev SQL image, and I'm going to tag this with a tag of v4. Now, I've already pushed a few images up there, so that's why I've got latest v1, v2, 3. This is going to be v4. And the reason the um, registry is different to the slides is that registries have names have to be unique. I've done this session uh, once or twice, and I've got the code up in my GitHub account, so someone's obviously run through the code, and they've taken my tests uh, registry 01 name. So I had to change my registry name, but no bother. Tag my image. Verify that it's tagged in there. There we go. And now I can push this to the cloud. Now I am cheating slightly because there are very similar images up there, but this is a, a 1.5 gig in size, so I don't want to wait for the whole thing to go up. So it's smart enough to know that layers four that make up my image already exist up in the cloud, so it needed to push those four layers there. And I can verify that just by listing the repositories in my registry, That's my dev SQL image, and then, then we can delve into that repository and show the tags as well. And then we are, I've got latest v1, v2, v3, and the v4 that we've just pushed up to the cloud. Okay, do a bit of a quick clean up there. Clear that down. Okay, let's delve into the actual portal now. We, this is my portal, this is my resource group, and here is my registry. For it, I can see that because this is a uh, on the basic tier, I've got 10 gig in total. I can have a look at delve into my repositories, my dev SQL image, and I have all my images here, and I can delve into them a little bit more and see the manifests of them, which is a little bit further information. I've got the op options for webhooks and replications, so I can do a little bit up in the portal as well. But let's dive back into the slides. So we have pushed a custom Docker image up into our Azure Container Registry. Now what we want to do is do something with that image. We want to start building containers with it. And the first thing I want to talk about are Azure Container Instances. And now this is Microsoft's offering to allow us to run containers up in the cloud without having to manage servers. So they are serverless. A little bit about Azure Container Instances. As I've said, it's running containers without need to manage VMs. We have a really quick deployment and we can deploy via the CLI, PowerShell, or we can go into the portal and deploy that way as well. Just to be aware that these things are built by the second. So the second you spin one up to the second you bring them down, you will be in charge for them. So usually it's not very much for an individual container instance, but the idea with these is we don't spin up one, we spin up 10, we spin up 100, we spin up 1,000, and that's when the price will start ticking up. So we have the option of Linux and Windows containers. Uh, be a little bit careful with the Windows containers as I, not all the options are available to them that they are in Linux. So we don't have the option for container groups, which I'll talk about in a second. And I don't think we have the option to persist storage yet. Last time I checked, we didn't, but you might want to double check that one. The second point there, containers are directly exposed to the internet. This has actually changed. When they first came out, the only option we had was to make their IP address public on the internet. And if anyone's ever exposed SQL Server on port 1433 to the internet, you can see what happens. And I'll show you in the demos exactly what happens. But we actually have the option to deploy these to a virtual private network. So we don't have to expose them directly to the internet. They will get an IP address and a fully qualified domain name if we specify one within our virtual network. Second point there is hypervisor level isolation. If anyone's worked with Windows containers, you actually have two types of Windows containers available to you. You have Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers. Hyper-V containers 
actually increase isolation of the container by running each container in a highly optimized stripped down virtual machine. Everything is contained within that one container and that is the level of isolation that we are getting here. And the final point there, we have the option to persist storage with things like Azure file shares. Another concept with Azure Container Instances is container groups. Now these are kind of similar in concept to Kubernetes pods where you have the container group with multiple containers in it. Each container is listening on the same IP address exposed on a different port. Now this, uh, an example of this would be a application container and a logging container. The application container is serving application requests and sending logging and metrics to the logging container, which is then writing them down to persistent storage. So they share the IP address, the containers are mounted on ports, and we can mount external volumes there as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and deploy an Azure container instance from our Docker image in our Azure container registry. Now remember I said the Azure container registry is a private. We only give access to who we want to give access to. And that's the same with things like Azure Container Instances and Kubernetes clusters. We need to grant our Azure Container Instance access to be able to pull our image from our registry and deploy it. Now, the simplest way to do this is to enable the admin on our Azure Container Registry and then do an Azure ACR credential show of the name of our test container registry. And that will spit out the admin details and we can grab those and drop them into our Azure Container Instance creation script and it will be given access. And that's great for, say, doing a demo or doing it one-off, but it's not the most secure way of doing things. Instead, what we can do is create a key vault. We can create a key vault and store details in there. And that Azure Container uh, Instance script can then access that key vault for, say, username and password to our Azure Container Registry. So we don't have to write down usernames and passwords or store them on Post-it notes on the side of our monitor or anything like that. It'll all be secure in our key vault. So the first thing to do, create the key vault, Azure Key Vault Create in our resource group of containers one, and then we give our key vault a name, AP Test Key Vault 01, why not? Now, then we create a secret, and we're saying Azure Key Vault Secret Set in our vault name of AP Test Key Vault 01, giving it a name of the secret, and then for this value here, we are creating a service principle in Azure that has the role of reader to our Azure Container Registry. What this is doing, is saying, hey, create a service principle that has the role of reader. It has access to pull our image from our Azure Container Registry and deploy it. And we're just giving it a name here, pulling out the password of this service principle and storing it here as a secret. And then the last bit, we're doing exactly the same thing again. We don't need to create the service principle. We're just referencing it here as Azure ADSP Show, query of app ID, and storing it as the user. So this is the username, this is the password, and we're storing those as secrets in our key vault so we can reference them when we create our Azure Container Instance. So let's go ahead and create our Azure Container Instance. So the first thing you say, Azure Container Create in our resource group of containers one from our custom image, so our registry name, techcontainerregistry01.azurecr.io slash a repository name, dev SQL image, and then the tag, so we could pick latest, we could pick what v1, v2, v3, v4, because those are the ones I've pushed up into my registry. We then reference the username, we say registry username, and this is where we pull the details, the secrets from our Azure Key Vault. So we're saying Azure Key Vault secret show, the vault name, the name, which is our test container registry, a one pull user, query value, and the output. So we have the username, we then pull the second secret, which is the password. So we're doing exactly the same thing again, just pulling the other secret, which stored the password for the service principle that has access to pull our image from our Azure container instance. Then we give our container a name, test container one, specify some resources for it. I'm going to give it two CPUs and four gig of memory, creating some environment variables. So I'm going to accept the end user license agreement. This is something you have to do every time you run SQL Server in a container. And then I'm specifying an SA password as well, so I can connect because Windows authentication isn't supported in SQL Server running on containers. And then finally, IP address of public. This was the only option we used to have. We now do have the option to deploy to a virtual network. And I'm going to open up port 1433 on my container instance so that when I hit the IP address that my container instance gets, it maps me through into port 1433 of my container 
the default port that SQL listens to, and I can connect from my laptop to SQL Server running up in my Azure container instance. So we hit execute, and then we're waiting for the container to come up. So we say Azure Container Show, name of the test container in our resource group of containers one. And it's going to come up pretty much immediately with that IP address there. But what we're really waiting for is down here, waiting for a provisioning state of succeeded. Once that comes up, we can drop it into Management Studio or Azure Data Studio, and we can connect to SQL Server running in our Azure Container instance. So let's go ahead and let's go through running a demo of building an Azure Container instance from the image that we pushed up in the previous one. So I'm already logged in. I can view, confirm that by listing my registries in my resource group. There we go. There's my AP registry. And let's have a look at the repositories as well. There we go. Dev SQL image. Okay, let's go ahead and create a container. So Azure Container Create from my resource group. My image name, I'm going to use the latest tag. Um, I pushed this one up earlier just in case the previous demo didn't work. And then we're pulling out our username from our key vault, which I've already created, so I should have mentioned that. And then pulling out our password as well, giving the container a name, specifying CPU and memory, environment variables, and our port. So hit execute, and that's going to go off and start building us our Azure container instance. So whilst that's running, let's spin up another terminal, and we can start looking to see if it's created it. There we go. Okay, so our IP has come up pretty much immediately, but our provisioning state is impending. So let's go and have a look at another container that I spun up earlier. So this is test container one, the one we just built is test container two. As an IP address there, and a provision state of succeeded. So I can jump over into Azure Data Studio, not going to use Management Studio for this. Um, if anyone hasn't played around with Azure Data Studio, it's pretty cool. There's some really nice extensions. There's one for um, SB who is active. There's one for SQL Server big data clusters. And it does seem to be quite a lot of stuff going on around this. So it's quite a handy little tool to have. So here's my IP address for my Azure Data Cluster. I can confirm that here, 9209. Right click and manage. There's my database. Remember, we ran that script to attach our database after, once the container spins up. So it ran the script, wait 10 seconds, SQL comes up, and it ran the create database from the two files that we copied in. For version 15, and if I do select that version, confirm that it is SQL Server 2019 CTP 2.2. Now this, I did say in the slides that it's a bad idea to expose SQL Server to the internet on port 1433, and let's show you why. If I come in here and grab my test container, is my second container coming up? Yes, there we go. And we can come in here, and I can see some CPU stats, I can see some memory stats, what's going on, networks, transmitted, things like that. If I delve into containers, you can see some properties of my container, but let's have a look at the logs. Port 1433, memory 4 gig, two cores. Let's have a look at the logs. This is why you shouldn't ever expose SQL Server publicly on port 1433, and it keeps going. So there's someone out there doing a dictionary attack against my Azure container instance trying to get in to my SQL instance running up in the cloud. And it will keep going and going and going. <laughs> so if you're going to run these things, you can deploy to a virtual network. I've posted a blog on how to do that. It's really simple. A couple of extra lines of code, and then you can deploy into your virtual network, and you won't have someone doing this to your SQL instance. Okay, let's close this down, and let's come back, and let's have a look to see if the other container instance has created. It looks good. Let's double check. Succeeded, and I've got my IP address. So let's grab the IP address, come back into Data Studio, drop in some details. Boom, we've connected. There's our database, and it should come up with a version of 15. Now this is going to be a carbon copy of the other Azure Container instance we went into because it's built from the same image. All containers built from the same image are carbon copies of each other. And there we go. SQL Server 2019 CTP 2.2 running in a Azure Container instance up in the cloud. 
Okay, so if I delete that connection, let's do, let's have a look to see what's going on with that container. Well, no, I can't type. There we go. I can have a look at the logs here. I don't have to go into the portal. There we go. There's our database being upgraded after it's been attached. And that should be familiar to anyone who's had a look at the SQL Server error log. And then if I want to clear it down, I can quite simply say Azure Container Delete. It'll say, are you sure you're sure? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Back into the slides. So that is deploying our custom SQL Server image to an Azure Container instance. The final part of this demo, uh, this session, sorry, is talking about Azure Container Services. Now this is Microsoft's offering to allow us to use an orchestrator to deploy and manage our containers up in the cloud. And it comes in two flavors. We have Azure Container Services, ACS, and formerly Azure Container Services, AKS, now known as Azure Kubernetes Services. Azure Container Services allows us to pick an orchestrator that we want to use to manage and deploy containers up in the cloud. So we could pick Docker Swarm, we could pick Kubernetes, we could pick Mesosphere DCOS, or if you're feeling really brave, you could build your own. Azure Kubernetes Service is specifically designed to implement Kubernetes, as Kubernetes does seem to be the leading orchestrator out there in the container world. And one thing about ACS is it is being deprecated. I think the end date for it, but don't hold me to it, is going to be January 2020. So Microsoft want everyone to migrate from ACS onto AKS pretty much as soon as possible. So what is Kubernetes? Well, it is basically a architecture and a whole bunch of coding to allow us to deploy and manage containers on a large scale. It is open source. It was built by Google has since then been donated to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, written in Go, but it's actually on GitHub. You can go and have a look at the source code for it. It is typically deployed as a cluster. We have a master and various nodes. The master controls the cluster, and the nodes are where we deploy our containers. But we don't actually deploy containers to a Kubernetes cluster. We deploy what's known as pods. Now, one pod can have more than one container in it, similar to the Azure container instance groups, where you have one pod, IP address, containers listening on multiple ports. But typically, you will see one pod with one container in it. Now, pods are mortal. They die and are reborn. And when they're reborn, they come up within the cluster with a different IP address. Now, that poses a problem for us, because if we're connecting to the pod by its IP address and it dies and comes back up, we've lost our connection. This is where services come into play. And services give us a stable networking endpoint over, our, over the top of our pods that we can use to connect to. So we connect to a service IP, and if our pod dies and comes back up, it doesn't matter because we're still connected to our service. So the pods can die, come back up with a different IP address. It doesn't matter. We're still connected to a service IP. And the final point there is we have uh, Kube Control, which is a command line tool to allow us to manage our cluster from our local machine. Okay, so I must admit, I found, when I first started getting into Kubernetes, I found it um, kind of intimidating. There's a lot of documentation out there. Um, the actual docs, if you want to know what a pod is, oh, it'll tell you what a pod is. And I was really sort of going, no, how on, how do I get, how do I get started with this stuff? And that's why I like Azure Container Services, AKS, or Azure Kubernetes Service, is because we can have a Kubernetes cluster up and running with one line of code. It goes ahead, and I'll show you in the portal, it goes off and it creates all the resources that that cluster needs off in the background. We don't have to worry about it. We just run one line of code. And then we deploy to that cluster via YAML files using, say, Kube Control, and we manage everything with the Azure CLI or PowerShell and Kube Control itself. So I say with one line of code to create a cluster, and here it is. We just say Azure, AKS, create in our resource group of containers one, given our cluster name, my SQL K8 cluster one. You will see Kubernetes abbreviated to K8S, and the simple reason for that is that there are eight letters between the K and the S. That's the only reason for it. So we say we give our cluster a name, uh, the amount of nodes we want up 
in our cluster. So we can have two nodes. And we can just generate some SSH keys if they're missing on our local machine as well. So we hit execute. And then we go off and we have to wait a little bit. Now, the quickest I've seen this come back is in about 12 to 15 minutes. And that's because it's going off and it is creating quite a lot of resources in the background. So go away, have a cup of tea, chill out, come back 12, 15 minutes, and your cluster will be up and running for you. But once the cluster's up and running, we need to be able to manage it. So we need to install Kube Control, Kube Cuttle onto our local machine. It's nice and easy. We just say Azure. AKS install the CLI and that will pull down C kube control XE from us and allow us to run kube control commands from our command prompt. Okay, so in order to connect kube control to our cluster, we need to pull down that cluster's credentials. So it's nice and simple, we just say Azure AKS get credentials within our resource group of containers one and of our cluster name. So my SQL K is cluster one. And you can see there it's merging. Uh, the cluster name as a current context in our kube control config file. So when I start typing kube control commands, I'm connected to my cluster. And we can view, we can verify that just by saying kube control get nodes. Remember I created this cluster with two nodes. So if all gone as well, I have two nodes there with the status of ready and I'm good to go. I'm connected in to my cluster. So let's start looking at deploying our custom image in our Azure Container Registry to our Azure Kubernetes Service Cluster. Remember, our ACR is private, so we need to grant our cluster access to it in order for it to be able to pull the image from the registry and deploy it into the cluster. We're not going to use a key vault this time. We're going to create a role within Azure that allows our cluster to pull the image from our ACR. So the first thing to do is grab the cluster ID and just say Azure AKS Show resource group of containers one, the cluster name, the query, which is the client ID, we need to get that, and we're going to output a TSV. Get the cluster ID, make a note of that, and then we're going to get the Azure Container Registry ID. So Azure ACR Show, Test Container Registry, resource group of containers one, query ID, and now specify an output of TSV, making a note of that. Now, I know we're making a note of these, but we only have to do this once so we can write it down and then destroy this once the role is created. And we create the role nice and simply just by saying Azure role assignment create, assignee client ID of our cluster ID, role of reader, allow it to read our images and pull our images from the ACR, and then it's defining the scope. And that's where we specify the ID of our Azure container registry. So hit execute, and that's our role created. So we can now deploy to our cluster and build containers, pods, on the cluster from our custom image in our Azure Container Registry. I mentioned that we deploy via YAML files. So here is a simplified YAML file. I'll take you through each little bit. First thing we're doing, specifying some metadata. We're just going to give a name and a label to identify what we're doing. So it's just saying, we're going to call this SQL Server. And then we specify a number of replicas. What this is saying is Kubernetes has a concept of desired state versus running state. We are defining our desired state in this YAML file. And when we deploy this YAML file to our cluster, it becomes the running state. And Kubernetes constantly checks the desired state versus the running state in a reconciliation loop. And if there are any changes in the running state that don't match the desired state, Kubernetes will automatically fix them. So what this is saying is at any one time in this deployment, its desired state is to have one pod running with SQL Server in it. So if anything happens to that pod, it will automatically be spun back up by Kubernetes in the background. So that's what we're defining there. It's called a replica set. So we've defined our, how many we want. Now we've defined the containers. So this should look familiar. We have a name of SQL Server 1 from our image, test container registry one .io, dev SQL image of the repository, and a tag of latest. Open up the container port 1433, default port that SQL listens on, and then we're specifying our environment variables. Excellent. So we've got the number of containers we want. We've got the spec of the containers. But we're not going to connect to those pods. We're going to connect to our service. So we're going to specify a name, SQL Server service. Specify some ports, so port on the, on the service of 1433, hit in a target port on the pod of 1433. 
So if anything hits my service on port 1433, it will automatically be mapped through to my pod on the same port, and I can connect to SQL Server. You can change these ports. Um, I've actually written a blog post on how to do that because I'm about to expose this to the internet, which is a very bad idea, as we saw in the previous demo. If you want to do that, uh, check out my blog. There's a post there detailing the different options you have for changing the ports on the service, in your pod, and in SQL Server itself. And then finally, I'm specifying a type. And this is a type of load balancer. And what this is saying is spin me up a load balancer in the background that will give me an external IP that I can use to connect to from my local machine. And all that's all it's doing. OK, so we have our YAML file. We can now deploy this into our cluster. We just say kube control create dash f from file and the name of our YAML file, SQL Server.yaml. Hit execute, and we should see the deployment being created and the service being created as well. And whilst that's coming up, we need to double check it. We can check everything. We say kube control get deployments, and if everything's gone well, we'll see desired versus current and up to date and available, all of one. Get pods, we should see the one pod there with the status of running, ready, one of one, and then get service. And what we're looking for here is the external IP to come up here. It'll say pending for a while, and then eventually it will pop up and we'll be able to use that external IP to connect in Management Studio or Azure Data Studio. One cool thing about Kubernetes as well is that it has an internal dashboard, and we can spin that up in AKS by a one line of code, and we can see different options for our cluster. So we can see things like resource consumption, the state of our deployments, our pods, our replica sets, our services. And we'll have a look at that in the demo now. So let's go ahead and deploy our custom image to a Kubernetes cluster up in Azure. Okie dokie. So I'm logged in. I've got my cluster. So if I just say get nodes, there we go. I've got my two nodes there with a status of ready. So we are good to go. Now I've already created my role to allow deployments from my Azure Container Registry. So I'm going to specify my location to my YAML file, which is exactly the same as the one in the slides, and I'm going to not do that, deploy to my cluster. There we go. So we can see SQL Server 2 created and SQL Server 2 service created. And we can double check on those. There we go. And it's that pod, that deployment has already come up with a desired current up to and available. We can check on the pods. It's up as well. Stay ready, one of one states of running. Okay. And let's have, we can actually delve into what's going on with the pods. So we can see here, it is pulling our image. It successfully pulled our image from our registry to create our container, and it started our container as well. So we've got our deployment saying it's up. We've got our pod saying it's up. Let's have a look at that service. And we, <laughs> we have the external IP up already as well. Okay, that was quicker than I thought it was going to be, but I'm not complaining when the demos work too well. So I can grab that external IP, drop it into Azure Data Studio, bump there is our database, and it's SQL Server version 15. Okay, so let's do something very quickly. Let's use database. And let's create a table within our database. Create table test ID int. We have a very simple table. And if we come here, we have a look at it. There's our table. And um, we'll come back to that in a second. I'm just going to close these down. But we've created a table up in our database in our pod, up in our Azure Kubernetes service. So just to disconnect that and jump back into the code here. Clear that. Okay, if I wanted to, I could actually remote into that container, just get the pods, grab the pod name, place it with the test one I was running earlier, saying kube control exec into this pod, running a bash command, and I can navigate to the directory that we created way back in our Docker file right at the start of the presentation, and we can have a look in it, 
there are our databases and that attached DB script as well. So that could be very handy for um, troubleshooting and checking out what's going on, things like that. Nice and easy to jump into any pod running up in the cluster. I said we can have a look at the Azure Kubernetes Service Dashboard. So very simple line of code, Azure AKS Browse. Here we go. And here is our dashboard. So we can see CPU usage, memory usage of our cluster, workload statuses, state of our deployments, state of our pods, resource consumption of each pod, the replica sets, and the services, and a whole bunch of other information here as well that we can use. Just keeping an eye on the time. There we go, close that, and I'm going to close this as well. OK. So we create that table in our pod, in our, in our SQL instance running in our pod. And I'm just going to grab this pod name, and I'm going to delete that pod up in the cluster. There we go. If we come back to game pods, see, we can see that one pod states of terminating. But what's happened here is the running state of our cluster has differed, of our deployment, sorry, has differed from the desired state. And Kubernetes has already realized that and is spinning me up another pod from the image in our Azure Container Registry. So if we have a look at it now, it has a status of running. So we can come back into Azure Data Studio, reconnect. There's our database. Just waiting for this to pop up. There we go. But if we drill down into our database, our table isn't there. Now, the reason for this is that that table was created after the old pod was spun up. It's not contained in our container image. So when I deleted the other pod, Kubernetes spun up a new pod for me, but any data changes I've made since I built that image have been lost. So we'd need to consider that if we're running SQL Server up in, a contain, up in an Azure Kubernetes service cluster, how are we going to persist our data? And there are different options available to us. So we have things like persistent volumes and persistent volume claims, which allow us to persist our data. So when we, if I deleted the old pods and I used a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim, I'd still have access to that table that I created afterwards. And I have written a blog post about that. You're more than welcome to check it out. It's on dbafromthecold.com. Let's jump to a bit of a tidy up. And we finally do the same service. There we go. And jumping back into the slides. OK, so um, I hope that's been interesting. That was a quick overview of Azure Container Registry, Azure Container Instances, and Azure Container Services, Azure Kubernetes Service. Um, all the resources, the slides, and all the code are on the link there. Got the QR code there as well. Excellent. That was brilliant, Andrew. Thank you very much for that. We do have some questions. First question, do you have any tips for writing your Docker file starting from nothing? I mean, how exactly do you get started when you put together your Docker files? Um, I've always, because I'm SQL Server chap, I always base mine off a Microsoft image. So I'm going okay. from a base image. So I want to say if I'm building from a SQL Server image, like in the Docker file there I'm building from SQL Server 2019. I can start from there. Or if I want to build and install SQL myself, I can build it from a Ubuntu image. So you'd always start off with saying, hey, from something and build from there. Okay, cool. So you showed us a demo of how to use Key Vault. I was wondering, does it actually have a cost? Um, are there any restrictions to its use that you've come across so far? Um, not that I've used because I literally have only used it for storing my um, username and password for the service principle for my Azure Container instances. I'm not sure about the cost. That is a good question. Yeah. Um, I will take a, make a note of that and come back. Okay, cool. I mean, you'd expect it wouldn't be much, wouldn't you? But uh, you I, never know. You never know. Is the, Yeah, that's a very yeah. good question. <laughs> I was quite interested seeing that you'd specified the number of CPUs and memory to, to use um, with one of your containers. What are the maximums to those settings? Is there, I mean, there must be a restriction. Do you know what that might be? Off the top of my head, no. I'm not. I mean, I'm guessing it might align to the, to the uh, data center host machine, I guess. Let's have a look. That is a good question. Costing. Let's try that. There we go. So you are build for your memory and vCPU. What are the maximums? Is a very good 
Ah, was there something? Just go up a couple of lines there. Uh, VP duration. Hmm, doesn't say, does it? Well, I guess that's one for people to download your code and try and ramp up as many uh, <laughs> CPUs as possible and see what they can uh, get the thing to break well, with. I would say that the main thing with these is to keep them light and keep the resources configured to the minimum because the idea with these is you don't have one beefy container instance. You have multiple containers. Yeah. They're all running yeah. certain things, yeah. That's actually a good segue then for another question because, um, I mean, I've heard this question a few times to me and I've actually given quite poor answers with regards to monitoring container performance, actually monitoring what's inside the container. Have you come across any good ways to do that? I mean, the one thing I noticed when you were going through your demo, there was, uh, and I don't know if it related it to containers, there was a metrics in preview option there somewhere in Azure. Yep. Um, there's quite a few things up in Azure that you can use. Uh, for the as there's this, with Docker itself, you can actually do Docker stats, and it will give you individual stats on each container that's running on your system. Up here, yep, there's the monitoring tools. Up here somewhere, I come in. Uh, we've changed it. There we go. So let's say, if me, me being a, a real Windows uh, guru, and I want to look at some perf counters, for instance, that's not really a, something that's going to be possible, is it? With a container to connect with a to container a... you can run I think it's docker top and it will give you uh, stats on processes that are running in your container and you can have a look at it that way so you yeah. can delve in to see things like that absolutely because you're running usually one process one main process per container you can basically use the stats that you're getting here there are some other here you go yep the metrics here so I can select memory what we've got here so I've got a whole bunch of stuff I can delve into my container service as well, about a memory management, and we can use the Kubernetes dashboard as well to delve in to see exactly what's going on on that cluster. And I guess with SQL Server, because you can get via the you know management views, you can get the SQL-related counters from there as well. I guess that's another way you could pull those things. Yep. When SQL's up and running and you're connected yeah. in, you basically have an instance of SQL Server that you can delve into all the DMVs with. Cool. So we've got a question coming from Kenneth Van Orden. Uh, how do you start the transition to SQL Docker containers when your current SQL security is based off of Windows authentication? That is a great question, and that is probably the Achilles heel of SQL Server running in Docker containers, is that Windows, Windows authentication isn't supported. One thing you could do, and it's what I did in a previous company, was take a look at a product called Windocs. And Windocs basically took, basically created a port of the open source software that Docker made available to the community and have customized it, which, and the reason they customized it was to allow for earlier versions of SQL Server to run on earlier versions of Windows Server in containers. But as a side effect of whatever they did in the background to the code, it supports Windows authentication. Right. Moving on. So, yeah, VS Code. I'm sure you've got loads and loads of snap-ins you use to do your stuff. Is there any uh, specific ones for this kind of stuff that you want to recommend? Absolutely. Uh, one thing I didn't show was the Kubernetes snap-in here. So I can come here and I can, I've got a second cluster there, but I can actually browse and have a look at my nodes, network services, things like that I've deployed, storage, things really cool and it's also got a plugin for Helm as well. Helm is really really cool it is a package manager for Kubernetes so you can use it to deploy to a Kubernetes cluster literally with one line of code you don't have to mess around with YAML files or anything like that they're all stored up on the Kubernetes hub which is here I haven't opened this for a couple of days so fingers crossed <laughs> and if we scroll down where are we spot it there we go we have a SQL Linux package in Helm as well so we can literally say Helm install that package and it will go off and deploy it to our Kubernetes cluster so I'd recommend the Kubernetes plugin there's the uh, Azure CLI there's a docker plugin as well let's have a look at some of these here uh, and then there's a few things like bracket pair colorizer <laughs> absolutely that's one of the best must have. Uh, DBA tools one as well here that you can right click and it'll allow you to search docs for things like PowerShell functions. That's really cool as well. Okay, excellent. Right, so we've had a question coming from William Andrus. Is there a way to just stop start ACI instead of delete deploy? There 
is an absolute way of stopping them. Yes, uh, off the top of my head, I don't have the code on me. Where are we? Oh, my bad, where are we? Oh, here we go. Sorry, it's the Everland screen like containers. Here we are. Logs, where are we? Um, I can't find that at the moment. I will come back to you on that one. Sorry. Um, okay, awesome. Yeah, we can post that up on the on the channel when, when you do send that one back. You mentioned about persistent storage to uh, Azure file shares. Uh, just to point, I, I presume this is probably obvious. I'm guessing that you want to have those file shares in the same region as your containers, or does it not really matter? I would, because then otherwise you're increasing the network latency across from your container to your storage. Yeah, so when you're managing your AKS cluster, can that only be done entirely th through KubeCuttle or, uh, and the portal, or is there any sort of third-party tools you can hook in like, to an appy or something? Uh, KubeCuttle is pretty much the go-to. There are a few other um, tools out there, that not that I've played with. Um, one nice little function, actually, if I come back here, is something called KubeShell. Okay, cool. This is basically, is, uh, here we go. I'm still using kubectl commands, okay. but it gives me IntelliSense oh, cool. for what I'm doing, which is really nice. But I'd say kubectl is pretty much the main one to be using yeah. to manage your Kubernetes cluster. Excellent. And on a related note, how does AKS integrate into Docker Enterprise Edition on Azure? Should you wish to use that? I would say this. Oh, I would say they're separate things. Docker Enterprise Edition is for deploying um, not I haven't used docker enterprise edition but it's for you set up things like swarm and you get the um, private registries and things like that up in yeah. Azure whereas yeah. Azure container services would be a separate offering okay so off the top of your head then you'd expect that you you wouldn't you wouldn't be deploying to AKS directly you'd probably be doing it sort of via enterprise edition then do you think is that would that if be you're using if you're using docker enterprise edition you'd be spinning things up using that product, whereas AKS would be separate. Okay. How do you, I mean, what do you recommend to newbies that they've never used Docker before? How do they get started? How did you get started from zero to getting to where you are now? Um, there is an absolute wealth of information out there on Microsoft's site uh, saying how to get started with pulling the Microsoft image down, installing Docker desktop, and I've written a blog post on how to get up and running with SQL Server 2019 in a Docker container on your local machine. It'll take you through installing Docker, pulling the image down, spinning that container up, and then connecting to it from Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, or even things like the um, MS SQL CLI. Excellent. Yeah, I've seen some of your early blogs, and they are quite, quite well, not quite. They're very useful to for complete newbies to get started. So, yeah. Do you ever do any, any Docker stuff in Linux, or is it mainly the Windows side of... Um, um, I, I have my, this is my work machine where I'm running Docker desktop, and then I have a, a separate laptop where I'm running uh, Docker on Linux. I would say Docker for desktop is pretty cool. I like the fact that you can switch between Windows and Linux um, containers. It's really, really nifty. It has its issues. Running containers on Windows 10 can be a little bit buggy, mm -hmm. um, but it's great for a development environment. Yeah. One sort of comment I want to make about desktop, I don't know if it's just my experience, but I've found desktop quite flaky when updates come in. It, I always, it always <laughs> seems to break my laptop. I don't know if that's your experience with it or... Um, yes, um, I've had it. If you come into, if I load this up here, wait for it. There we go. So every time I see uh, an update come into Docker, especially when I'm doing presentations, it can be a bit of a it's a tense moment in time. Um, one thing I would mention about if you want to get started with Kubernetes is there's an option here for Kubernetes where you can click and just enable it straight away. And that will spin up a one node cluster on your local machine where you can deploy to and play around. So if you don't have an Azure account, that is a brilliant way to get Excellent. started with Kubernetes. Um, you say it's caused issues. Um, when I, f it, I think it's fixed now. When I first enabled that about 20 minutes before a presentation at SQL Saturday Manchester last year, it blue screened my laptop. So be prepared. <laughs> okay. 
Well, I think that wraps up all the questions. Thank you very, very much for giving us a, a great session, Andrew. Hopefully, I'll get you to come back in again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.